Hey pals, I'm here today to talk about the books I read in the month of March. I only managed to read seven books in March. Now one of them was quite long, but to be honest, towards the second half of the month I just didn't read anywhere near as much. Binge watching lots of Drag Race, very nearly caught up with it all now. So yeah, haven't got lots of books to talk about and I'm actually going to take two books out of this stack and talk about them in a separate video. One of those is An Illusion of Thieves by Kate Glass. This is what it looks like. And the other is um, Legend Born by Tracy Dion. So I'm going to talk about both these two in an upcoming fantasy video because I have been reading quite a lot of fantasy books. These are both fantasy and I plan to carry on doing that for the next few weeks. I'm just going to do a roundup when I have a few more to talk about. But I gave this one four stars and this one three stars. So and they're both the first book in a fantasy series. There are those and then I have five other books to talk about in this video. The first one I'm going to talk about because this one has a lot of buzz and most of you will know what it's about is Lustre by Raven Lilani. Now I was interested in picking this one up because I had heard that this was what people call a millennial book. Now a lot of the times I find that millennial fiction tends to have quite cold and detached characters which is something that I personally struggle with as a reader. I really need to feel an element of warmth from my characters even if they're not likeable I need to feel like I'm being sort of let in and like they feel something from what's happening in the world around them. I find that when we have characters who have managed in whatever way sometimes because of trauma and sometimes because of an element of, of self-control when they detach themselves from events around them I just find that personally difficult to to enjoy as a reader and so I was worried this could err uh, on the edge of that but I was also very intrigued by it so I gave it a go. Now I gave this one three stars and I have very mixed feelings about it to the point where I'm not really sure what star rating I should give it. So as you may know this is a contemporary novel about a young black woman. She works for a publishing company. She is one of the only black women working there and she starts to date an older white man who she meets online. He is happily married, his wife knows he's seeing another woman and during the course of the novel she becomes more entangled in this man's family life and at some point she actually lives in the house with this man, his wife and their adopted black teenage daughter. So I knew all that going in because that's the blurb you hear people give but I didn't hear anyone mention the violence in this book and I wish I had known that before picking this up because I think I may have avoided it. There's a lot of things I can read in books, like horrible things, and, and I can manage it, but something I find really difficult to read is violence that is very clearly based on a power imbalance. A lot of the time that's um, like because of the patriarchy. And the person who is the victim of that violence feeling like they want it to happen or they're enjoying it. So I just find that a real struggle to read and there's a couple of scenes in this book that are quite awful where she wants him to hurt her and, it, and he does, he obliges and it's just really unbearable to read. So the first few days I was reading this chapter a day, it was making me feel really depressed, I wasn't enjoying it, it's just like watching this poor woman just dive headfirst into a relationship with a man who's obviously just enjoying the level of power he holds over her because of his age, his gender, the colour of his skin and his wealth and it's unbearably uncomfortable to read. However the second half of the novel focuses much more on the narrator's relationship with his wife and daughter. Now this is one of those books where you read it and you're just like why are you making these decisions? It makes absolutely no sense and it is difficult to put yourself in the narrator's headspace. But once you get there and you accept that she's sort of just going along with everything because she doesn't really know where her life's going or what to do, the relationship that blossoms between her and the wife and the daughter is pretty interesting to watch and, and he becomes much less a part of the narrative. And so then I found it quite easy to finish this in one sitting and there was elements like certain sections where the commentary was really interesting or I really enjoyed paragraphs of the writing style so I feel like she's an author I'll watch and depending on what her next book is about I may pick her up. Um, I think if it's about any type of power and balance in a relationship I'd probably avoid it. Um, it's weird because I 
recently read um, Acts of Desperation by Megan Nolan, which was about a really toxic relationship. Um, and that was very mentally horrific, but it didn't ever become like really physically violent. And um, I struggled with that, but not as much as I struggled with, with this one. So yeah, I, I see why lots of people really love this novel and I see why lots of people don't. I sit somewhere in the middle and yeah, there was elements I appreciated and elements I really struggled with. So there is that one. And then another new release, I was kindly sent this one um, from Picador and that is The Lamplighters by Emma Stonix. I read this one in three settings. It's a really easy sort of cosy read. So this is set I think in... Let me double check. So it's set in two timelines. This is based on the story of um, a group of men who worked on a lighthouse that was offshore. So it was a lighthouse that didn't have a house attached to it and it was just on a small, very small island. There was not even any space to walk on the base of this lighthouse. And they, they disappeared and the mystery was never solved as to what happened to these men. It happened in the early 1900s. Um, and the doors were locked so nobody could ever figure out how they managed to lock the door from the outside because it only internally locked and it's remained unsolved and so the author was inspired by this true event but she placed it instead in the 1970s um, so we follow these three men who are working on a lighthouse and we also follow their wives and partners in the 1990s as a author is interviewing them to write a true crime about the, the loss of their husbands and partners. So we know that these men are gonna go missing and we know that 20 years later it remains unsolved. So I enjoyed this. I gave this three stars because I think it was a solidly enjoyable novel, but there was also a couple of points that I, I didn't love and also I just didn't feel like this was a standout. I would recommend this. I think if it's a, if you like um, cozy crime things like a, an, edge of the historical, um, very character focused, I think you'll enjoy this and I don't at all regret reading it. Um, but I just didn't think this one completely sung. So one element I was unsure about is that all the perspectives in the 90s from the woman's point of view are dialogue of the woman talking to the author, but you never hear what the author says in response. So it's like a monologue from each of these women about what they want to tell the author and it feels quite a stream of consciousness and it also has an edge of gossip to it because the women don't really talk to one another anymore and they have sort of problems with one another because of what happened to their partners and I just was unsure about that choice to tell the woman's story like that I didn't really know what it brought to the novel other than being uh, perhaps like a little bit irritating so, because it makes the woman all feel self-centred, even though they're not. As soon as you remove the responses of another person, it reads like they're just talking without any response or interruption, which of course isn't the way the conversation would have would have gone. And then the, the men's sections are like their, their logs, what they write in, in their diaries. So they are first person perspective rather than um, sort of dialogue and you know I found it really interesting none of these lighthouses exist anymore they're all um, automatic so nobody has to to live like that um, and I find it fascinating the fact that some people did have to live like that and they would spend 40 days offshore on these lighthouses as I said they could just manage to walk around the base of the lighthouse but it was very dangerous um, you know the, the waves could appear very suddenly um, so to be contained in a very small space with other people um, all of it sounds quite unbearable um, and, I, and I don't know how all of these men didn't lose their minds and I think you know a lot of them did um, and once they managed to make these lighthouses automatic years later um, a lot of the organisations that employed these men have admitted that it was entirely inappropriate so you watch the story of these men I don't want to give anything away but you, you watch their mental state and you start to build up to a possibility of what could happen and in all of these men's storylines there is a mystery that they themselves and the women in their lives are hinting at 
And so you're constantly building to what each of these mysteries are and how each of those mysteries tie together for the ultimate mystery of where these men disappeared to. So I enjoyed this one. It was a really, um, like I said, quick and cosy read, an easy read. I read it very quickly. I would recommend it, but I don't think it's anything spectacular. Next one I want to talk about, I read on my e-reader, and that is A Nook at Midnight, A Story of Hope, Justice and Freedom by Brittany K. Barnett. I hope that's the title, I haven't got it to hand. Now, this is a um, non-fiction book. It is quite heavily memoir focused, but it's also a non-fiction book about Brittany's work as a lawyer and the cases and the people she um, works with. Now one thing I will say about reading on Kindle, um, I picked this one up via Kindle because it's only released in the US, super expensive to get over here, but it was one I really wanted to read. So I was really happy to be able to get it for a reasonable price on my e-reader. But I have not yet become like accustomed to how to use my e-reader, I've never had one before. And so um, I'm not very confident with like highlighting it and, and saving bits I want to read out, which I would find much easier in a physical edition. So I apologise if I don't get names of all these um, pieces of legislation that I'm going to reference correct because I haven't got them to hand. So Brittany K. Barnett grew up with a mother who was a drug addict and her mother got um, incarcerated for a ridiculous amount of time simply for carrying a small amount of drugs that she herself was going to use. And so Brittany became a, a corporate lawyer working with nothing to do with drugs but she always had an interest in helping um, specifically young women whose mothers were in prison oh, and imprisoned you know for a ridiculous amount of time in comparison to the crimes they had committed. And as she worked as a corporate lawyer, she was contacted by somebody asking if she would be able to, to help a woman who was incarcerated for supposedly being heavily involved in a drug ring. And she worked on this case for a couple of years, trying to get this woman out. And as the drug laws change in the US, she becomes more and more involved. And as she starts to win cases, people know of her more and she gets asked to be involved in more and more cases. Now, if you enjoyed Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, I'd really recommend this. This is much more memoir focused. Um, there's a lot in here about, um, you know, the first third is about Britney's childhood and teenage years and, and becoming um, educated as a corporate lawyer. And then the second two thirds is more focused on the people she gets to know and how she helps them. Um, but you get to know these people as individuals much more than you do the majority of the people in Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. So I think this one, is, I think Just Mercy is really accessible, but I think for people who prefer more of a narrative, this is even more accessible. The main thrust of this book is at a certain point in the US, a new law came in which said that the unfair laws comparing um, cocaine in its rock form to its powder form, and I can't remember the exact number, but you got ridiculously penalised for carrying it in its rock form and compared to its powder form, and, and it was not um, representative of of how strong or how damaging the drug was in those different forms. Instead it was it was a rapist law because um, a lot of black people um, take cocaine in its crack form, it, um, it's cheaper, and a lot of um, middle-class white people take cocaine in its powder form. And so people were being incarcerated for their whole life for carrying the drug in a, in a rock form that if a white person was carrying in a powder form would maybe get a couple of years. But this this law was re, was redacted, so it was changed, but it wasn't made retrospective. And it wasn't made retrospective for the people who were already incarcerated unfairly because they felt that would be too much work um, for, for the justice system. Insane, that you can, you can acknowledge that a law is corrupt and grossly unfair, but say all these hundreds of people that are in prison for life, it's too much paperwork for us to get them out. Throughout the book and throughout Britney's time working as a lawyer, um, Barack Obama brought in a law saying that he, he did want to make this retrospective and he had a goal of how many people he wanted to get out each year and you, you were allowed to apply. And so Britney starts to work with more and more people um, trying to apply and say these people fit this criteria and they need to be released. So yeah, it's, it's a really interesting book. You hear about all these people as individuals, their likes, their dislikes, and the mistakes they may have made, but how these mistakes did not warrant them getting life imprisonment. And um, I really enjoyed this. The one thing I will say is that 
really care about that very clearly, um, you know, loved Barack Obama as a president and um, admired him for what he did. But there is there is points in the book where she acknowledges that the promises he made um, in regards to ensuring that a lot of these people were released from prison were not upheld. But she doesn't really delve into that at any point and I think it's because she really loves him. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that even though Barack Obama has done a lot for the US and was probably better than any other president they had, and yes it's wonderful that a black president was voted in, he's not perfect and actually he could have done a lot more for these people who were in prison. Um, and she doesn't really go there um, and I, I wish she had. So I really enjoyed this one, um, I gave it 4 out of 5 stars, I definitely recommend it if you are interested in the criminal justice system. The next one I want to talk about is a short story collection that came out last year in the US and I really enjoyed this one and that is The Bead Workers um, by Beth Pyatote. So Beth Pyatote is an indigenous scholar I believe at UC Berkeley and she is an SPAS enrolled with Colville Confederated Tribes. I really enjoyed this one and I think this is a wonderful mix of short stories so this had a couple of short stories in that were funny but in a really darkly humorous way so for example um, there's one story which is focused around a, a young woman who works in um, the art scene and she's trying to create a board game um, based around Native American history um, for an interactive art piece and she makes all these cards, you know, like when you're playing um, Monopoly, you get a chance card. The game has, has those sort of cards, um, but each of the cards are like horrific and they reference laws that were put in place that really negatively affected Native American people. And it's all done in this sort of jokey way. So it would say, you know, rather than go to jail being just like a part of the board, um, that would be a response to something horrific that was being done to um, Native American people um, and I found that story excellently written um, really perfectly executed so, so you got the element of humour that this woman was trying to go for with the board game but it's also heartbreaking so I really enjoyed that one um, there's a couple of stories in here about people trying to um, to find family members they hadn't met like there's a girl who has been adopted by a white family um, and she knows her, her father um, is Native American and so she goes to try to find her family and to meet him um, and that doesn't necessarily go well. And then there's stories about people who, who meet one another and, and build a friendship, uh, you know, something goes wrong and they're pulled apart but they always feel like um, they're missing part of themselves because of this connection they had to another native person that they they don't have in anyone else in in their town. I, I really love this. Um, the author is a and I'm, I really struggle to say this word, so I'm going to try an indigenous language revitalization advocate. Um, and a couple of the stories do reference that. And one in particular um, that I thought was beautiful. I'm going to read a section out. So um, this man finds a selection of tapes which have um, a recorded language that barely anyone alive can still speak um, and he he takes it to this man who he knows is um, a surviving relative of the woman recorded on these tapes um, and we get this section here Joseph can't make out the stories but he recognises the rhythm of speech and he catches words here and there Sometimes he hears a man's voice in the background or a dog barking. A child speaks, then seems to leave. The women laugh a lot, but sometimes their tone is serious and sometimes a long pause connects words or thoughts. These silences are dense with feeling. The sounds make Joseph long for a world he barely sensed and never truly knew. He hears screen doors creak open and closed, the low hum of a generator, a radio voice that goes on, then off. Joseph pictures his great-grandmother's house as he knew it from photos. The gingham curtains, a bowl of apricots on the counter, peonies blooming in a vase, a table ringed by wooden chairs. He listens to the mix of their voices and the ambient sounds, and the hospital room is filled with that time, which does not move forward or back, but rests in the lap of the present. I just thought that was beautiful, and the writing 
throughout this book is as beautiful as that and really filled um, with history and feeling so I highly recommend this one. The last one I want to talk about is going to be perhaps the most difficult to talk about and that is Plain Bad Heroines by Emily M. Danforth. Now I buddy read this one um, with Sean from Storytime um, and Jessica so I'll link Sean's channel and Jessica's Instagram down below. Definitely go and check them both out. I had loads of fun buddy reading this. This is over 600 pages. It's a pretty chunky book and we read it together in a week. And then we went to um, an author talk hosted by the bookshop Gaze the Word. Uh, once we just got right to the end of the book and it was a delight. And I really loved reading this. So I'm going to tell you what the book's about and then I'll go into my feelings about it. Um, this is the first book from Emily M. Danforth in I think just over 10 years. Um, her debut novel was a YA contemporary called The Miseducation of Cameron Post. I've read and really enjoyed that. And this is an adult literary fiction novel with elements of gothic horror, mystery and queer romance. And I loved so many things about it. So this is a difficult novel to describe but I will try my best. In the early 1900s there was a boarding school for girls at which a gruesome death takes place. Two girls who are in a queer relationship are stung to death by a um, wasp's nest. Like thousands of wasps sting them to death. Um, and beside their bodies, a book called I Await the Devil's Coming by Mary McLean is found. It's a real book. It was published in the early 1900s and it was a very subversive book about the author um, being queer and loads of, it became a bit of a cult following um, and I think at some points it was banned and it has this cult following at this all girls boarding school. Following that a couple more deaths happen at the boarding school and this book is always found beside the bodies, okay? In present day we are following um, three young women, two of whom are actors and one of whom is an author and the author has written uh, a novelised book of what happened at that boarding school and she has links to the descendants of the woman who ran the boarding school so she got like loads of inside information and her novel is being turned into a like blockbuster film and it is being made into a horror by this really famous horror writer and there's lots of nods in this book to um, contemporary um, directors and, and films and authors and um, real people like Truman Capote and it's very like gossipy and LA and when I say that I think that sounds like something I wouldn't enjoy. I loved it. And this book is told by a um, unnamed narrator who's not an individual but this sort of overseer of the story and there's lots of footnotes and it's told in a very sly way so the the narrator will say things like um remember this later readers because this will be important or they'll say oh you don't really need to bother remembering this character they're of no importance to the story um, and they make lots of comments or give you lots of additional information and so yeah you you keep going back and forth between um the present day when these women are trying to make the film and they go back to the, the boarding school and it gets a bit scary and then you go back to the past and see the real scary things that unfolded. I was absolutely in love with this for the first 450 pages. A tab loads, every single page was breathtaking, filled with uh, queer love, like gothic joy, um, every single sentence was perfectly written, so witty and drenched in um, and feeling really evocative and I loved it. I loved every reference, I loved every little sly wink of the eye, I adored it. But the last 150 pages I didn't like as much and we went to an author talk for this hosted by Gaze the Word and Emily Ann Danforth admitted that she never plans her novels, she never um, structures them and knows where she's heading and that became apparent and I also felt with her first novel and um, the weakest bit was the ending and it held true for this one. I don't want to spoil anything but what I will say is there's several mysteries that carry through this novel and at the end you think you're going to get a resolution and you think there's going to be this big 
uh, crescendo like it's building towards more and more horror and then it just sort of simmers simmers out um, and it has a couple of pages of an info dump that don't really make sense and don't really tie everything up and it just lets itself down a bit so I adored loads of this um, but I felt like this reminded me a little bit of the TV show Lost where there's so much crazy shit and you're like oh this is going to be amazing when we find out how all of this makes sense and then you don't really ever find out how it all makes sense and that's a little bit how I felt here like it was building and building and building and it just went Ooh, and like gave up um, and I also felt like in in hindsight that the um, the present day um, three main women leads weren't brilliantly developed because again I felt like more was going to happen to them in the last chunk and it, and it didn't um so i i loved this and i got so much joy out of it but from a critical perspective i can see that this isn't a perfect book um but if you do like the sound of it i would really recommend it it was a super fun read um and i would happily just like pick it up and reread it now um which i think shows you how much i still enjoyed it even with a fairly weak ending so yeah those are all the books I read in the month of March. My arm is so sore now that was so heavy. I shouldn't have held it up for that long. And yeah, I'd love to know if you've read any of these and what your thoughts were on them. Especially if you've read Playing Mad Heroines, I'd be really intrigued to know your thoughts. Um, let me know if you have any other books you would recommend based on my enjoyment of these ones. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.